Good evening. I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. My colleague and co-host, Thaddeus McCotter, WJR, the great voice of the Great Lakes, a recovering politician. Good evening to you, Thaddeus. The election, with two weeks to go, there's a lot of electioneering going on. And my question to you, looking at this with new eyes, uh, seeing the foibles of electioneering, the war on women, Thaddeus, you were in the Congress and you survived the elections when this was a very, ex- a very powerful uh, theme for the Democratic Party. Did the Republicans in the House talk about this among themselves while they were being pummeled by it? Was it a, a concern or was it ignored? Well, it came slightly after my time, John, but the reality is everyone knows that it's a made-up charge, that it's political if you will, can't. But the reality is you have to deal with it. And so I think one of the steps that the Republicans took, obviously, earlier in this term was when Kathy McMorris Rogers gave the State of the Union response. I thought that was a good step forward, and it shows that Republican women, after what I would argue is a very long and undue delay, are starting to rise within the leadership ranks of the party. And that's when that occurs, John, that's when this type of argument will cease. Not yet. Not yet. I welcome Mona Charon, writing most recently at the Washington Examiner. The column is entitled, What Women Want, but Mona directs her attention to the war on women and how it is that the Republican Party made itself vulnerable uh, by emphasizing candidates who were remarkably inept and perhaps even stupid, but I'll just say they made inelegant remarks that were unacceptable at the time and inexplicable these years later. That is no longer the case. And Mona, as I prepared for this today, I was watching my Twitter feed from the DCCC. I'm a happy consumer of the DCCC. They tell me everything I need to know. And I saw yet another ad or promotion, vote now, vote your vote counts, the uh, GOP war on women was one of their hashtags. So they haven't backed off, Mona, but it's completely ineffective. How do you measure the the deafness of the DCCC this year? Good evening to you. Good evening, John. Um, well, um, one measure of how badly it's going for them, I mean, this, this tactic that worked so well in 2012, arguably, um, is the race in Colorado. Um, the uh, I wrote this piece about 10 days ago uh, for the Examiner. It was kind of a long lead time. It's a magazine piece. But in the interim, um, the uh, Denver Post has, uh, no less, um, has endorsed Cory Gardner um, it, because they were... They were kind of shocked and, and appalled by the tactic that Udall, um, who was uh, one of the chief practitioners of this war on women stuff, um, was, was using. He, he was accusing, first of all, most of his campaign dealt with gynecological issues, <laughs> abortion and birth control, and he misrepresented completely uh, his opponent's positions, um, as, as a number of Democrats are doing around the country, part of this war on women thing, is they have to misrepresent Republicans and make them seem as if they are not, you know, as if they are opposed to birth control, that they want to outlaw birth control, or sometimes the phrase is used, they want to deny women access to birth control, um, and they want to ban abortion, even in cases of rape and incest. And of course, this isn't true. It's a misrepresentation of the candidates, but the Republicans are getting canny, and they're figuring it out. And um, so w- one um, Republican leader in particular who was, who was very s- smart about this was Bobby Jindal. And he devised the technique of uh, coming out in favor of making birth control pills available over the counter, which is something that the, you know, American Association of Obstetricians and Gynecologists has promoted and, and agrees with and so on. And so when he does that, it's, a, it's very disarming because it's very hard to portray somebody who's in favor of making the birth control pill over the counter as some sort of knuckle-dragging Neanderthal who wants to keep women barefoot and pregnant. That is. Um, so... That's one way in which they're fighting back. Uh, Amona, I, th- I would think that the the key to this for the Republicans is a continuing ability to actually 
talk <laughs> to the voters <laughs> <laughs> in a way that doesn't offend them. And as John mentioned, you had cited some instances of Republicans who clearly did not know this was the 21st century, let alone the 20th. Uh, could you elaborate on some of those? Oh, well, that was, yeah, that was in 2012, and there was um, Todd Akin and, uh, and Richard Murdoch, and they made comments about legitimate rape and ignorant comments about, oh, a woman's body shuts down and doesn't get pregnant. And it's really dumb comments, uh, which were, of course, amplified by the media, which is tending very left and doesn't ever point out, for example, that the Democrats have very, very uh, extreme positions on abortion, too. And, and I, I talked about this in the piece. You know, the fact is that abortion is not a winning issue for Democrats. A lot of people have that wrong. Um, but, but, but anyway, there are ways to get past the issue as long as you understand that, you, that Republicans cannot present themselves or be, allow themselves to be portrayed as extremists on this issue. Once they get past that, then they can begin the conversation with women about what really matters to them. And as I discuss in the piece, women are more economically vulnerable than men, especially single mothers. And because of the decline in marriage rates in America, we have more and more voters who are single. And they're highly aware of their vulnerability. And the Democrats have been able to offer uh, what seems like an appealing um, package of government supplied security, and you know the the cliche that that single women are turning to Uncle Sam to be a sort of surrogate husband is not that far wrong um, but but the best way for Republicans to respond to that is to understand the vulnerability of single mothers. oh, and by the way, married women tend to vote Republican. But Republicans should understand these women's vulnerability, understand their needs, and address them in ways that are not sort of pandering, you know, to women as women, but that in ways that will be appealing to all people, but in, but also to um, to them. So, for example, the the Rubio um, Lee proposal uh, to to make. Um, uh, to make tax credits, uh, larger tax credits available to parents for raising children and to make it refundable against uh, payroll taxes as well as income taxes is a really great step in the right direction, really makes an impact on the, the daily lives of ordinary people. Um, you know, job sharing, flex time, you know, Republicans are accused of being against equal pay. That should be met with ridicule. Equal pay for equal work has been the law since 1963. The proper response when Republicans are accused of being against that is to say, well, gee, that was, that was the 1963 legislation. Do, do the Democrats have any other bold ideas that are new? Um, and uh, anyway, so that's that's the um, that's the sort of message you want to frame it so that so that women will feel that they are understood and that their their lives will improve if they pull the lever for a Republican. What I'm hearing from you, Mona, is not that the Democrats were so clever, but what explains the Republicans being so obtuse for so long? What you've said is very commonsensical. I'm wondering what the reservation was in the party. Can you, can you find it? I think that Republicans believed the Democrats' version of what women wanted more than the Democrats themselves mm. believed it. Mm. The, Demo the Republicans were afraid that maybe the Democrats are right. Maybe it's all about abortion and birth control. Maybe that's what women vote on. And it isn't. Um, if you look at survey data about what women think is important to them and what, what they vote on, you'll find that they say abortion is important, but guess what? It's one of the least important things that they list. If, they, if given a list of things to, to rank in importance, it ranks near the bottom as a priority. Um, and, you know, once it is, once you bat down and, and rebut these ex, these. Uh, false uh, accusations that you're opposed to birth control and so forth, um, then, then you have a hearing because what are women concerned about? They're concerned about the economy. They're concerned about their security. They are very risk-averse, women are. Um, we find that, you know, for example, financial advisors will t tell you that men are more open to risky investments than women are. Women choose safety. Women are more wary of nuclear power and uh, the military and uh, guns. Uh, you know, they just, they tend to be more risk averse um, than men. Uh, but there are ways of understanding that 
and explaining and and pitching to women as to men again not making it an exclusive uh, feminine appeal uh, but you know the government can only take you so far it can prevent you from falling into destitution but it cannot offer you a ladder up that can only come from a good job and all the polling suggests that women are very concerned about finding jobs, finding good jobs with good wages, and finding security through that route, through the route of a good private sector, well-paying job with benefits. And that is what Republicans should be aware of, that women are receptive to that argument if they, if they pitch it right. They don't have to worry that women are all about an army of Sandra Flukes, you know, marching off to get their free birth control. Thaddeus, just a moment here. When you're campaigning in a 50-50 district in the very blue state of Detroit, at least, uh, and Michigan, at least from the last elections, did you find that women's issues dominated in the fashion that the Democratic Party maintains? Uh, no. <laughs> no. And what we're seeing in this election is actually an indictment of the Obama administration and its policies by the very people who helped pass them. The reality is, this is a mirror image of what would happen when Republicans were in trouble. When Republicans were in trouble on the economy or on the Iraq war, they would try to stress the social issues. And much of that emphasis would lead to some of the inelegant, I would argue, moronic statements that uh, Mona has elaborated and enumerated. But what the Democrats are doing here by playing this this false war on women card is actually indicting the failure of the Obama administration's recovery on the economy and the failure of Obamacare and the failure to bring about successful uh, standing of the United States within the the world community. So they're actually doing the mirror image of what we used to do. Now, as for what Mona talked about, I think that the first thing the Republicans have to do is listen, stop listening uh, to partisan Democrats and start listening to actual working women uh, starting in their own homes and within their caucuses and within their electorates and constituencies and this problem will tend to resolve itself. It's not about the bedroom, it's about the dining room, it's about the time and the quality time and the vulnerability that women have today within this economy and within this ever-changing chaotic world. Final moments here, Mona. Just a quick answer. Look into your crystal ball. Will the Democrats put this away as a failure or will they bring it back? Uh, I think they'll bring it back uh, because they will think that it wasn't that they didn't say it well, that they didn't say they'll they'll conclude they didn't say it loudly or often. Right, enough. right. Messaging, right, Mona. Right, messaging, messaging. messaging. <laughs> Mona Charon, writing the Washington Examiner. She often writes to the National Review online. That is McCotter, recovering politician, WJR, the Great Voice of the Great Lakes. I'm John Batchelor. <laughs>